And here there are a couple examples from the case studies mm -hmm. based on those. And then then I connected mm -hmm. to our MHEL yep. papers and showing some further examples mm -hmm. about scale. That's great. Yeah. I sent it to your email. The stick doesn't go into my computer. Uh, it doesn't allow me to use a foreign stick. Sorry. No, is it uh, my... Both your emails. <coughs> <laughs> I guess so. Sure. Anna, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Hi. Hi. Okay, it's Michael. Yeah, hi. Uh, nice to meet you. I'm just going to mm -hmm. do the moderating. So, yeah, I think we are not going to use this, so I think you could, you you sit, could here? sit here because this is for online participation and oh, we don't have any. Fine there. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very small. Where you can sit there. Mm -hmm. I guess so. Mm. Did you get it? And you're. Uh, I will tell Michael that it's second is digital literacy and gender. Yeah. Sorry? Should I tell him that after you it's digital literacy? Then gender? And then gender. Alright. Because I think he has it the other way. Okay. So the time is running now. I would like to ask you to sure. uh, start as soon as possible. Sure. Um, one minute. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Just to make sure because there's the clock yep. until it's running uh, down. Um, you have I understand. Time. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, yeah, send it to me. Yeah. It's all right. I switched off the VPN to open Gmail, but no sticks. And the VPN doesn't allow me to stay off. Site can't be reached. I don't know why. Uh, Mugi, it's reached you. Mm -hmm. Just reached you. Are you interested in a water bottle and glass? Yes, yeah? very much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> you too, or? Yeah, I'm good. Thank you. So don't get any hurry, but the time is running. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Whenever you're ready, Nidia. You got this. You have the stick. Yeah. You, or <coughs> she can start after you. So. Oh. Yeah. So shall we just start? Yeah. And you can tra and you can transfer your slides later. Whenever you're ready, Michael. I don't. You hit that button. The big button. Here. Okay. Good morning. Good morning, let's get started. Uh, this session is uh, the Dynamic Coalition on Innovative Approaches to Connecting the Unconnected. Uh, my name is Michael Kendi, I'm one of the co-conveners. Uh, great pleasure to be here. Um, just a few quick words of introduction. Uh, every, we, every year we hear about um, the numbers of uh, connected and it's been a, with the ITU and it's been approaching 50% for a few years. And now it's past 50%. And we often hear the reminder, 50% is great, but that leaves another 50%. But the other reminder that we don't hear as much is that the growth rate is really slowing down. Every year, the growth is going slower and slower. And that's pretty early in the adoption cycle for it to be slowing down. Hence, the need for innovative approaches to connecting the unconnected. And so we've been doing this now. This is our fourth time at the Internet Governance Forum. Um, the first in 2016 talked about um, the first efforts, uh, a very innovative effort to gather data on innovative approaches mm -hmm. that uh, Christopher Yu will talk about in a moment. Um, but that's really to try and get be more systematic about what's working and what's not working on both the supply and demand side to try and figure out uh, ways of overcoming this slowing growth and keep the keep the momentum going, connecting everyone. Uh, then we uh, invited uh, a number of grassroots organizations, some of the ones that had been studied in these case studies, 
Um, and it was fascinating discussions about uh, the efforts that people had been taking in different countries around the world to connect the unconnected. And last year, um, Christopher and the team uh, introduced uh, cost data from a number of uh, the case studies to start to synthesize them and see what the learnings were from all of these case studies. So this year, building on all of that, um, there's going to be three topics discussed based on um, this initiative, One World Connected, that uh, Christopher will talk about. And these three are just a, an overall gener a cost analysis, looking at the case studies and the data that's been gathered on the demand and supply side, uh, and then looking at two, two, er two areas of particular concern, uh, efforts around gender and efforts um, to build up digital literacy. So what we're going to do is there'll be three presenters from the coalition. Um, that will be presenting on each of those three topics. Each of them will present for about 10 minutes, followed by a commentator talking for about 10 minutes, which will leave us half an hour for uh, what no doubt will be an excellent discussion, questions and answers among you. So without further ado, uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce the, the driving force, the engine behind all of this. Uh, Christopher Yu, a professor at uh, University of Pennsylvania. Christopher. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you all for coming this morning, uh, seeing so many old friends and some new ones, so it's always a pleasure to reconnect with people. Um, I just didn't get in the substance, just because that's what we're all here to do. If you would do the slides, please. So One World Connected, as Michael said, is something we've been doing several years, and it is uh, the mission that we have is to create, is really driven by exactly what Michael said, to try to, to deal with the slowing rate of adoption when only half of the people in the world are connected. And what we discovered is there was a lack of real effect. Many people were trying new things, but there was no data being collected about what was working and what was not. And the biggest problem for me is that uh, what many ministers were, being, were hearing was sales pitches from equipment vendors or particular business interests or people falling in love with the technology and advocating for it and uh, in ways that weren't necessarily data driven. And my personal conviction is that, in, that there's no one magic technology. Almost all these deployments will involve different ones in different situations. But anyway, people would very much lock into one idea without actually having any validity. So we actually uh, surveyed at least 14, I think, major databases to call to identify every innovative deployment we could find, a way to a very innovative program to attach, connect more people to the internet. Um, in fact, well, we made a, a decision to uh, identify all of them, not just the successful ones, which are the ones that get covered in the press. And we can now have a database created to do that. That we then contacted all of those, uh, we have 1,029, I believe, at this time. Uh, we uh, have, have contacted them all and asked them to do structured case study interviews, of which we now have 120. Uh, we structured the interviews in a way to try to develop cost, an estimate of cost performance and uh, revenue performance to try to understand which ones were sustainable, likely to be sustainable, and uh, that really to try to create an information base to drive the future. And the next direction we're going now is we're in the process of fielding, uh, answering a different question, not just how to connect people but what does that do for you in terms of sustainable development goals? Healthcare, education, but particularly economic development. And to do that, we're using what is the gold standard of social science research, which is controlled trials. And we're fortunate to have a number of partners around the world. Uh, happy to share a little bit of what we're doing with that in the future, as of now. And then uh, this next phase for us is disseminating the findings to try to share with uh, interested audiences what we've learned. So let me give you a brief introduction to the case studies in the database. Uh, so as I said, we now have the database itself is 1,029 entries that span 151 countries, uh, the, the largest share in Africa and in Asia, as you might imagine. But interestingly, there are also a number of case studies in North America and Europe which we don't often think of as needing as part of the digital divide, but what you discover is things such as tribal lands in the US or the Scottish Highlands in parts of, of Europe remain as difficult to connect as many other parts of the world. 
Interestingly, uh, what we found is there is a division between what we call supply side and demand side initiatives. Supply side is uh, infrastructure. Demand side is a reality I think many, most people in this room know. We used, uh, there's a line from a movie, if you build it, they will come. We've discovered uh, every, the, many surveys have confirmed that that is not true that you need to do digital literacy education, relevance education, you need e-government, other services. No one buys an internet connection for the sake of having one. It's to get services you can achieve through it. So actually we have a higher number of demand side interventions than supply side. Of the, they span 151 countries and the database and many people have found it to be a very useful research tool. The case studies are of 120 at this point, spanning 51 countries. The geographic distribution is very similar, as is between demand side and supply side. We have a distribution of rural, urban, and urban distribution of uh, projects, and different geographic scopes, national, local, regional, and international. Happy to talk further about that if you would like. And I should apologize in advance, I will not be able to stay through the question and answer period because of another obligation to speak at another uh, session, but the rest of the team can handle any questions you might have because they've done the lion's share of the work of actually generating the case studies. So the first most surprising thing I would tell you is that 62% um, of the projects we surveyed in the, in the case studies have no revenue whatsoever. And this is a problem because their funding sources are often from grants or corporate social responsibility. And what the reality is, is when those sources stop funding these projects, uh, they will probably cease to exist. Uh, all of them, have, they're attempting to transition to paid models, but the problem is that uh, all the attempts to do so have largely been uh, problematic and very difficult to, uh, to execute. Even more importantly is the problem seems much more acute for demand side initiatives than supply side initiatives. Uh, still a problem on the supply side, nearly 40% do not have revenue, but on the demand side, seven, nearly 75%, nearly three quarters do not. What this tells you is if you're doing a digital literacy program, you can't just do it uh, for basically free. If you have no means of then uh, trying to gain some benefits from the people who preceded you, the idea that you could turn this into a sustainable program becomes much harder to do. And if you look at the distribution of how the types of the different funding sources, what you discover is roughly 80% of grant funded, government funded, or corporate social responsibility funded projects have no revenue model. The subscription models and the community network models are better. But this is a, an interesting change. We've advocated to grant-making agencies to change their approach, to start to look for sustainable business models, uh, to fund projects that have revenue, to validate possibilities for the future. And we're actually gratified to see that many of them have changed their policies as a result. Um, what's interesting, uh, um, we've talked more about different aspects of the program, happy to do that as in past years, happy to continue that discussion. But I wanted to share with you some preliminary results about cost effectiveness. The key for us is to collect data, which is rarely done, but to do it also in a way that permits cross-project comparisons. We were told by a number of people at international organizations that they appreciate this, it's needed because politically they cannot pick winners and losers among projects and an, inter um, an academic based research project can. So what I will tell you is we've actually set up a metric through our structured case study interview that allows a sort of cross uh, uh, project comparisons. We actually have a number of financial statements shared with us by the projects. We have our structured interviews and we asked all of the projects to fill out templates about what their deployment was. The revenue side is a little bit uh, more estimate based. We actually found out what the reach of their, the total number of, of, of beneficiaries they were able to reach and used a revenue approximation based on what they were charging if they had revenue at all to make an overall estimate of their total revenue. So to share with you some very preliminary findings, what's interesting is uh, what many people worry about the cost of building the networks, the capital expenditures. Uh, what our biggest headline is, I would say, is that the operating expenditures end up being far more important than the capital expenditures. If you cannot operate on a profitable basis, you will actually borrow money and then continue to lose money with every year you operate. 
And so I think that uh, many people focus uh, too much attention on building networks and not enough on running them. And particularly, uh, we all focus a lot on the back of the last mile of delivery. Many of the, the one of the biggest sources of costs in operating expenses is the backhaul costs themselves. Um, with the, most of the deployments, the largest numbers we have are in two technologies, TV white spaces and Wi-Fi deployments, usually often paid Wi-Fi deployments. What's interesting is um, the cost of TV white spaces tends to be higher than Wi-Fi. Primarily, uh, one large driver is the difference in spectrum costs. So there is a policy interlay here where the spectrum policy of the governing institution ha has a large influence over which models can be successful and which ones are not. The second driver is uh, the expense of TV white spaces radios. Uh, I will note as we, uh, that three of the four TV white spaces projects are pilots. TV white spaces is a new technology. The cost of radios may well go down. Uh, one of the more interesting deployments is one in India called Gram Marg, where a university is trying to create their own equipment. The costs are lower because they're doing their own work and they don't have to pay a commercial deployment, but you start to see these very innovative ideas. And what you also see is the Wi-Fi deployments are wi much more widely variant in costs. They tend to be lower, lower, but they tend to be much more variable depending on the nature of the deployment. A couple other things about costs. Um, what we discovered is that just comparing per user costs can be misleading. For example, the, the projects that have revenue tend to have higher per user costs than projects that don't have revenue. Why? Because they're receiving revenue, they're investing in higher end services. And so you actually have to look at what's being delivered compared to the cost instead of just doing simple comparisons. You also have to consider how large the deployments are, how much many people they're reaching to try to make some estimates of how these are going before. Another issue that came up in previous discussions at the, at the IGF is whether uh, deployments of connectivity to anchor institutions, these are community centers, schools, libraries, is an adequate substitute for uh, connectivity. Many people believe that you need to give every person their own device. Uh, what we've discovered is that is a great aspiration, but anchor institution distribution ha can reach many, many more people. And uh, it uh, is a good option when in person to per every person having their own connectivity is not an option. Uh, that is quite interesting. Uh, our preliminary, uh, on what we discovered is uh, oh, roughly half of the ones that have revenue, we talked about the supply side, it's about 60% have revenue. Uh, of those, our first estimate, we're still working on the model, is that only two of them appear to be breaking even. So there does seem to be a revenue problem on the, even among the ones that do have revenue, and that in fact uh, there is wide variance in purchasing power parity across the country. So just comparing costs can't actually evaluate impact because obviously different countries are in different parts of socioeconomic development. The last and probably in many ways the most exciting part of the work that's developed now is going beyond connectivity to try to measure the impact of connectivity. We are actually in the process of fielding three controlled trials, one in Rwanda, one in Vanuatu, one in Nepal, to see the impact not of just connectivity, but what it gets you in terms of economic development, healthcare, and education. Uh, we actually believe that this is a critical component to the dialogue because uh, it's very easy to get a communications minister excited about connecting more people to the internet, but if you want to mobilize a health minister, an education minister, a finance minister, and especially a prime minister, you, they have to ask you what does it get us as a country? And the health ministers that we've spoken to who, who are even committed to the idea need to ask me, should I give this 5% of my budget, 10% of my budget, in a world where I have many other KPIs to deliver? And so they need, and in fact, the investment finance community, the international finance community says this sort of data is critical. We went to this literature thinking that we would draw on existing models, and we found out there are no existing models. It has never been done. 
And so there are many retrospective models, but a true experimental control trial has not been done. So the one in Rwanda is based around a deployment by Vanu, the late by Vanu, the company that's building 60 sites. Uh, that we randomized across the 30 to try to get an estimate, and in fact, we're getting, we're working with the government to get data on economic development. Uh, Vanuatu is a telemedicine deployment where they're using their initial connectivity to do re remote diagnosis. The, uh, it's, a, it's based in the second largest island, Maiwo, and there's no hospitals on the island, so this is really to determine when you need to, uh, a person, an island resident needs to undertake the high costs of traveling to another island. Interestingly, the two different hospitals they could travel to are on separate islands and they specialize in different things. So it becomes a critical, early information about where to go becomes critical. And we were fortunate to have the chief and the head of this project attend uh, the IGF uh, two years, two IGFs ago. And in Nepal, there is a maternal health deployment that is actually looking at giving a pregnant mother's apps and connectivity to see if we can improve antenatal care visits and maternal and new newborn health outcomes. Uh, we have done the baseline estimates for all of these projects so far. Uh, we are now getting prepared to go back and do the retrospective uh, estimates just to understand how this goes. In some of the countries, the government has changed. So we are in the process of renegotiating our understanding with the new ministers to get access to the data, but we are optimistic that those will all be completed properly. So what comes next? Um, we are continuing to do work on cost modeling. Uh, in addition, there is some interesting work we're doing, uh, if you see four lines down, on some fixed wireless projects. There are four projects in the U.S. that have given us fairly complete data where we can do even more, uh, uh, more detailed analysis. analysis. We're developing sub-reports by region and developing academic papers around a number of uh, topic areas within this, particularly on the demand side, gender, uh, M Health apps, digital skills training, the role of partnerships and uh, challenges. One of the more interesting sources is we actually had all the projects report their most significant challenges and we're trying to figure out differences across different types of deployments to figure out what different areas, urban versus rural, national versus local, all the differences and how they play out. Uh, we um, are doing more, we're continuing the controlled trials and have hopes to expand them into Latin America. Uh, and one particularly on health centers in Latin America and another one in another country in Latin America. And another, the last area perhaps, is we could use the help of the people here in the community. Our goal is to try to find venues for disseminating the findings in the next year to interested bodies. And if you have suggestions on places where that could happen, we are uh, really welcome your input. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, that clearly highlights the value of gathering data to be able to help uh, guide the impacts and, and, and how, uh, how money should be raised and spent on these kinds of initiatives. Uh, now I'd like to turn over to uh, the commentator, uh, Jane Coffin from the Internet Society. Jane? Thank you very much um, and welcome all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. We are focused very much on infrastructure development. We have been working with community networks for over 13, 14 years. And um, as Professor Yu has said, there is some question in some people's minds about the type of longevity and sustainability of community networks. I'm here to tell you there is longevity and sustainability. Um, I would say that we have to think about this from a paradigm, sh paradigm shift perspective. These are startups. We're looking at startups. And in the internet world and in the world of economic development, when you're a startup, you might get startup funding from venture capitalists, right, as a small company. Some of us, whether it's APC or the Internet Society or USAID or another organization, the Tushetti Development Fund, if you know Georgia, putting in money, small seed money, to build out these networks. These are community-built infrastructure, a lot of people in the communities don't have bank accounts. They don't understand business plans. So we talk about sustainability plans instead because it sometimes it's a little scary if you're talking about a business plan. So I do believe that over time you will see a, a shift in that eco economic development model in the rural, remote, and urban underserved areas. We've seen viability from New York City Mesh in New York City, believe it or not. That's a community network being built out, Wi-Fi uh, based. There is um, a community in Georgia where we're seeing return there because it's not just the communications ministries that are involved and it's not just 
local um, this local business, but it's also international organizations coming in to say, what can we do to help you? Not that we know better, because if you come in to try and say we have the solution, you don't, because you don't know these organizations, you don't know these countries, you don't even know that region. So two weeks ago, we were in the Republic of Georgia in Tbilisi. We are seeing new interest in the community itself. So I believe we've got to start looking at impact from a different perspective. It's not just about are they immediately bringing in revenue. It's what is the community-based model for sustainability. You've got to start in some rural areas with a different shift in mindset and coming about. And so we've seen 50% an increase in Airbnb reservations in this high mountain village in the middle of Tusheti. It's 4,000 meters above sea level. There are people connecting with other people in the capital. They're bringing revenue back into this area, and it's rejuvenating tourism. That's good, bad, on depending on what you believe about bringing more people into a remote area. But it's also giving the Georgian government a paradigm shift in change. If we stick with the old model of how companies built networks, we will never connect people. Now, I'm not popular when I say this, and some companies, I used to work for a big company years ago. Um, I know that through change in licensing, universal service uh, policies, telco mindset in, a, in the regulatory bodies has to change. The GSMA had a statistic that came out that said in communities of 5,000 and under, major companies can't get a return on their investment. So if that is the case, we have to change the shift, the paradigm. So we come in with smaller networks, we come in with sustainability training, with technical local, local training. So from my perspective, after seeing what's happened, whether it's in Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, five to six Latin American governments have changed their spectrum policies. They're looking at new licensing. So I believe we've got to shift our focus on what, our, what we collect as far as data goes, on what we say is development, economic <laughs> development, and how, how that impact is measured. I am not an expert in this, but I feel it and I know it from having done this for 20-something years. <laughs> This for me is real in the sense of rural development. And it is empowering those local communities though because you can't just go in and say this is good for you, that's ridiculous. And a lot of people will do that. And so we've got to figure out a way to work at that local level. It's not easy, it takes time. We've seen this with internet exchange points. It takes seven years in some countries just to get to the point where the regulator and the incumbent can come together and talk about a change in the policies, right? So seven years is a while, and you've got to hang in there. So from a development perspective, from the traditional development agency's perspective, I couldn't agree with you more. We have to shift the billions of dollars or millions coming in, and people will say, why do you think you should give them only 10,000 or 5,000? I'm like, how do I know what they need on that level? You do have to do an assessment, but if you're actually, we've had community networks say to us, please don't give us that money. We'd rather have training. Because money at times can corrupt the local system. It can also just create a very strange competition that's not sustainable among local people, and you don't want to see that. And there are people in this room who are more expert on this than I am. But I get really worried about agencies that say, and, and it's weird for me, how can a development agency in this day and age with all the technologies say that they can't give out small amounts of money? We hear this philosophy that it's, it costs the same amount of money to give out $2 billion that it does it from the infrastructure inside an organization to give out 10000 Seriously? Can't they change that? And I think they can. And so many of you work with development agencies. I used to work on projects in the field. You've got to be, take great care with the community that you're working with. A, you don't want to corrupt that community. You've got to think about the change. And you really, I think we can do this collaboratively. It's not just the Internet Society or the university. We've all got to come together and almost put these factors together and say, we're seeing this change. We see these factors. How can we work with you to change that? And is it a holding organization that can take that money, foundations maybe, gently push it out because you do have to take the temperature of the community so that you're not creating difficult change or corruption in the community or local conflict because we don't know at that some, at certain levels. There you go. So thank you, Jane. And I want to really emphasize some things that you're saying that are really critical 
is that um, I do think we need need new, need new approaches. Um, what's exciting is you mentioned community networking, um, community networks. And we have Carlos Ray Moreno, who will comment later, who's a leader in actually building community networks and has insights into this. 25 of our case studies are of community networks. And what's interesting to me is um, I see a sea change happening. Uh, the, the program I'm going to leave here from, from here to speak at is being convened by two uh, trade associations of traditional uh, operators. It's um, Etno and ASEAT, both in Europe and South America. And one of the topics that they're talking about is how do they relate to community networks? And what you're seeing is a maturing of their perspective to understand that community networks can actually reach communities in areas which other places can't serve. And this is critical. Another thing Jane emphasized that comes out clearly in our research is capacity building is essential. You have to figure out many times um, a grant, if they, a grant making or organization or a government stands up a build but doesn't create the capacity technically to keep it up, it doesn't stay up. And as we know, all equipment needs to be updated, maintained, and as something that we've discovered in our research, uh, sometimes the latest and greatest technology isn't always the right thing. Sometimes it's the simplest and easiest to maintain and the most off the shelf that becomes critical. And so understanding the capacity of the organization and the community you're with and building those kind of ties becomes absolutely critical. But I think that you know, exploring even within these different worlds, different models that work and don't work, some of them, um, there does have to be a way to think though how it can be sustainable in the future. Some of it could be sustained government support. Uh, one of the most exciting ones, Rhizomatica, has a paid Wi-Fi model on $3 US per month per user. That's been training a lot of other people. That's nothing magic about that. It's, you have to understand that, how that fits. But there are a lot of interesting ideas that many people didn't think were possible that are now seem to be succeeding. Great, thank you. And I thought uh, since uh, uh, Christopher has to go off to this other uh, event that we could take some questions on, on this first uh, phase, the, or the first part of the presentations, the, cost, um, the costs and uh, questions for either Christopher or Jane, please. Did you have a question? Oh, no, Mike, I, th I thought you were raising your hand. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make one observation is that I kind of object to this figure that's constantly um, put about that half the world is connected because, uh, you know, for me, it's the affordability factor is, is key in those people that are connected. So to my mind, actually, of those half that are connected, probably three quarters are barely connected is what I would put it. So um, I think we need to take that into account that, you know, many of those places that are so-called connected, people really don't have the funds to be able to use that connection effectively because it's on a high-cost uh, mobile network where there are high data charges. Um, the next uh, question I had was, uh, have you avoided looking at municipal networks? I assume you have avoided this because and there must be like a thousand municipal networks in, in the U.S. alone that are doing this kind of thing already. And I think that that kind of uh, local authority provision of services is also something that uh, needs to be uh, more well known and more well understood. And then my third observation is about the emphasis on the economics. Um, you know, I think, and this came out interestingly enough in the Colombian IGF, was that uh, you know in, in these remote rural areas. Uh, the conclusion is that the, it may never really be fully economic to, uh, and economically sustainable to, to connect those people in remote areas where they're very sparsely populated. Um, so, you know, to, to look at the social benefits and to try and use the, the um, observation that the social benefits are, are really important for digital inclusion in the countries and to use that as some form of metric for driving government support for those areas. I'd just like to draw your attention to uh, the Pathways Commission report last year which said um, connecting people in poverty is predominantly a matter of affordability but the business as usual approach setting prices to recover infrastructure investment will never be affordable for the poorest in society. Thank you. Well, thank you, Mike. It's always a pleasure to interact with you. A um, couple thoughts. We did not do, <clears throat> within this study, we made a choice not to look at municipal networks. Um, there are not thousands of them in the US. It's, more, it's probably in the low hundreds, uh, if that, <clears throat> maybe 100 and change. Um, I actually am doing work. I actually pulled the audited financial statements of every municipal fiber build in the US. 
and I live in the city where they try to build municipal Wi-Fi. Uh, to be honest, the story of municipal broadband in the United States is not a happy one. Uh, they largely fail. Uh, partly lack of political support. It's one mayor's pet project. When the next mayor comes in, it's very hard to create additional support for someone else's success. But also, um, what the, my early take on my the data isn't completely clear. The hardest part, though, is um, whether I'm trying to study whether they fail because of too, many, too high capital costs, too high operating costs, or insufficient revenue per user. And my net conclusion is leaning towards the last one, because uh, getting people to go, when you're basically it's a constant marketing game. Particularly if you have an area where they're served by multiple providers, you're bombarded with ads. And I think the, t the cities are very good about running the networks. But marketing telecommunication services is a full-time job, particularly if you're overbuilding an area where there's existing providers. And where they do, they often start up with, with projections that are far too optimistic. They think because of the government, they'll get 70% adoption. Every provider will tell you no one gets 70% adoption. It just doesn't happen. So sometimes the projections are unrealistic. But even so, in a competitive environment, it's very hard to even get 30. And, so it, and you need to be coming up with some fancy marketing campaign all the time. About the too much emphasis in economics, um, I do I'm sort of, I don't want to oversell this, but I do think the economics matter. I think that um, there are more uh, cost effective and less cost effective ways to do it. And even if you're talking about a, a, a build that will not be sustainable, that will rely on government funding, learning from the past about what's working and what's not working in terms of technologies, in terms of business models, I still think is critical because in this day and age, even now the government has other needs it needs to fund. And so the extent to which we can do it more effectively, so much the better. Um, we actually have some spectacularly well-funded projects that have failed miserably. I mean, it's like, like two orders of magnitude more funding than other projects we compare to. And to try to learn what people were thinking, because these were very smart, very well-meaning people, but to, make, to try to understand what led them to, to the deployment that they were doing and then understanding how that's not going to, what went wrong, we think is still an important step. And to find out um, if we're going to rely on alternative models other than um, subscription-based funding, we need to actually figure out what that's going to be and under so people, governments can make the commitments they need to find out what the size of that is and how to make that to actually make these builds stay up in the long term. Do you mind if I throw one thing oh, in for you? Oops, go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I think there's a factor that is missing, and I would ask you to take a look at it. The reason so many of the Muni networks, because they, have, they haven't survived because of the embedded historical rules and regulations. There is a policy and regulatory regime that is anti-Muni, that is anti-community network. I'm from Maine, rural area. I have to go wave my phone up like this where my parents live in order to get a signal. And part of that is because of the old infrastructure and the old networks. So I'm thinking about doing what Steve Song had to do and see if I can work with my mother, who used to be a councilman. She's volunteer, by the way. This was her night job. Um, to work with the town, to sustain the town. And this is local volunteerism. But it is sustainable. You'll find that there's more demand and bankable demand in some rural areas. Now, this is, of course, in a, a place that has, uh, well, there's poverty, a lot of poverty in down east Maine. People don't know where that is. But in any event, there are people, though, who will afford connectivity. And I just got a ping this morning about young college students in the D Democratic Republic of Congo for going food for connectivity. Carlos has these stories as well from Senzaleni. And I don't want to sensationalize that. But I want to say that people make choices. And if you're choosing connectivity when you've got to make a choice between food and networks, that's really like sad that we're at that point. There is going to have to be some government support. And let's be honest, everything is subsidized in the, in the old telco model, too. There were great subsidizations for the companies and incentives. And I think that's where universal service funding, too. Let's think of different ways that we can do that. But I think if we start to look at the policy, regulatory, or municipal rules, there are some networks that try to get off the ground with modest funding, but got just killed because the local government said no, because they were swayed by the big companies. Now, I'm not anti-company, 
because we're seeing a lot of the great work. Telefonica is doing a great project in Peru where they're changing their mindset. And I would also put out a modest proposal to the big companies. If you know you're not getting a return on investment in communities of 5,000 and under, why aren't you creating smaller business units to go do that? Now, this isn't the solution for everywhere because some people want their own local sustainability and political governance. So some of this is very much tied to local rules from whether it's tribal, sovereign. And so I would just say from a modest sense, I think we've got a real problem with embedded historical reg pol architecture. We have remote participation, so the mic is essential. Um, hi. Nicola Bidwell. Hi, uh, Nicola Bidwell, um, Namibia. Um, uh, I was lucky enough to work with Mike last year on um, community net looking at the impact on community networks, much at the gender and social impact. And one of the things, and Mike brought it up, and Jane mentioned a, a little bit, but um, I would sort of like to crystallise it a little bit in academic terms, if you like, that um, impact and paradigms become a tautology. Um, so one of the things that I uh, frequently hear when I hear resilience is actually I hear neo neoliberalism. Um, and um, so when we were looking at these, and this is, might be a bit pu pushback on this idea of the gold standard of controlled studies um, and how nice it is to percolate all of these results onto a one-page um, uh, schematic that you can give to a policymaker. It, what it doesn't include is all the knock-on effects. So we have colleagues at the end here from Bosco, which is, pr creates a, a very good example that when we were, looked at um, community networks where, which are seriously bootstrapped by funders, um, is uh, that actually there are, it's a whole ecosystem that it builds up. You have a community radio, you have people who learnt to build solar in the community networks that then go off and develop their own franchises which work with a local, local net network operator. And, and all of these things cannot be assessed in a snapshot um, one year you know, study, they can't even be assessed by interviewing particular people in community networks. You actually need um, very deep studies of how these ecosystems emerge, and many of them have gone off to cities that you don't know what happens to those people ne later. So getting back to my question is what can we actually do to unsettle this problem that we measure impact across certain ways about the eff efficacy of business models um, and, and we're only ever going to create the same story because we, we can't think of all of these many diverse impacts that cannot be captured in the, these type of studies and what do we need to do to make this accessible to people who do want their one page schematic. Um, so I hope that's not um, too, too hard pushback, yeah. Not at all. <clears throat> so I, I hear what people are saying and I, I, I want to say maybe part of the answer is that we think that our study will not provide all the answers. Uh, we do think that understanding the costs of it is part of a critical part of the question. And <clears throat> research is a long play. And even when we come up with one study, it's going to be one point estimate of one intervention in one country where we won't actually even know how representative it is. But how you learn is you build that up over time. I take seriously the notion that there are secondary effects from these deployments. The problem is we don't even know what the primary effect is under things that we can measure. And that this study doesn't answer all the questions that need to be answered is not the right way to think about the value of a study. First, is there any impact on healthcare from giving a maternal app to a health app to pregnant women? Is a great first order question. There's no doubt that may create collateral benefits and those need to be measured, but that is not asking one study to answer all those questions at the same time 
leaves us without any real evidence where you end up seeing people doing things based on very well thought out conjecture, very well meaning conjecture, but as we all know, some of the best thought out plans don't work out the way we think, and it isn't until we get into the real world that we find out what really works. And so I understand, I don't have to take that as a pushback at all. I actually, this is, it's the modesty of how you build this kind of information base. Sorry, we'll move on and we'll have time at the end for questions, um, but we'd like to move to the next topic. Um, so one aspect in every country is that there are many people who could go online um, who have act networks available, whether the, the, the models being studied or uh, others, um, but haven't chosen to go online for a number of reasons. One of those reasons is uh, digital literacy, just uh, not knowing how to go online or not knowing how to make a meaning meaningful access, uh, may make that access meaningful. So to talk about that topic, again from the University of Pennsylvania, uh, Sharada Srinivasan, uh, please go ahead. Yes. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, if you can just have the slides on the computer show up on the screen, that would be helpful. Uh, so um, I did want to start with a disclaimer, very fun. Um, I recently started, as of two months ago, uh, working at the Digital Development Global Practice at the Bank, at the World Bank, uh, and the results that I am presenting here are not representative of those views. Uh, I maintain an academic research fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, and all of the research that I will be talking about here are informed by the work that I have done over the course of the last two and a half years at Penn. Um, that aside, this is what I'm going to talk about. My presentation will be brief, but hopefully meaningful in generating discussion as well. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the digital skills portion of our uh, database, and I'm gonna talk about what digital skills really are, because a lot of people claim that they are doing a lot of digital skills training without a lot of synthesis on what kinds of training are included and not. I'll talk a little bit about what we know from both our data, as well as the extant literature on skills and digital skills training. And lastly, I will go into some of the open questions that need more research, that need more answering, that need more thought from policymakers, some of whom might be in the room. Quickly, this is not like this is not very, very new. I just wanted to give you that like we have like over a thousand plus projects in our database, 1029, as, as Professor you mentioned. Over of the 120 projects that we have case studies on, we have 24 projects that are out of schools digital skills training across different audiences. And we have 13 school-based digital skills training projects. So totally that gets us 37 projects from over 23 countries. And the distribution of that, as you can see on the chart, is like quite varied. We do have um, a, like both North America, Latin America a little bit, Africa, and South Asia. We don't have a lot on the Pacific on the digital skills training side, and that's one of the drawbacks uh, from our study. Uh, as Professor Yu mentioned, uh, as across demand side projects overall, with digital skills training projects, nearly three-fourths of our projects do not have revenue. Most of them are ad hoc, sustain corporate social responsibly funded or grant funded. Some of them are loosely supported by governments without like having a very systematic approach to dealing with it. And digital skills trainings projects, as with our overall 1,000 plus projects database, are a big part of our case studies. We have that they are the biggest constituent of the different kinds of things that we have studied. So community networks are the second biggest and the digital skills trainings are the biggest. So what do our data show? Our data show that like most of our projects are grant driven and corporate social responsibility reliant. So they don't have a viable business model. And uh, we take the, the comment very seriously from early on that like you have to not think about uh, sustainability just in terms of subscription or revenue. But in digital skills training projects, we still need to think about how it will continue, how the curriculum will change, how like they will be able to support newer training. And that can be from different sources, but at this point, that kind of thinking does not seem to be appearing within the ad hoc projects that we have studied. They often run with a grant and then they end and they don't have much by way of follow on work from that. The second thing that we learn is that there is a wide variance in curriculum and pedagogy as well as the mode of delivery. What do we mean? We mean that there is like projects that are dealing with school children, primary, middle school, high school. We have projects that are dealing with out of school youth. We have projects dealing with farmers, adult literacy, 
see uh, campaigns in, in certain countries. But we don't have, and we have like mode of delivery is any, anywhere between in-person telecenter training, in-person uh, digital skills training through, uh, through a sustained program, app-based training, web portals, uh, language training. By So there are different ways in which this is being done. But there are no standard ways to decide what's fit for purpose in a particular context. It seems to be more based on the people proposing this grant. Like they, they saying, OK, we think that this is innovative. And we think that the, this will get us the, the grant to do it. But there isn't a clear. Most of the projects that we studied across digital skills didn't have a needs assessment within the community. And some of them reported they changed the way they delivered content after they got the money and went into the community and realized that the needs were really different, needed to be in a different language, needed to be in a different, uh, di different level of basic slash advanced study. Last one, there wasn't much by way of measuring specific outcomes uh, in terms of learning of digital skills. It's hard to say because digital skills have a spectrum. Uh, different organizations have def defined it in different ways. There are basic skills, intermediate skills, advanced skills, according to the ITU. Uh, there are, like, the EIU has a huge competence framework around what digital skills mean. Some people consider, like, social cogn sociocognitive skills as part of the whole digital skills framing. Some people think this is really about machine learning, artificial intelligence, coding-based skills. But we don't know what each of these skills are leading to in terms of outcomes for the people that we are affecting. And this is like uh, this is one of the findings from our data, which show which basically like leads to a lot of questions on what we need to be thinking about. The other thing that we also know is that there is a huge variance in terms of cost. Professor, you already presented some of the cost data on the supply side of the, of the work. But even on the demand side, there's a huge variance based on whether it's a CSR initiative, what kind of grant, where it's from, how long it is for, uh, what, what the duration of the program is, how many number of students it trains in person or a facility based or online based. There's a huge amount of variance. And the other thing that we see is that most, like a lot of our projects are really based on volunteer-based funding or some form of community funding. And that's sometimes very beneficial, as I will talk about in, in some of the later work, but often begs the question, if the, we do not have this critical mass of volunteers or if we are not able to galvanize it through the project that we initially start, how is it that we will continue to maintain that kind of skill set uh, given that there's lack, uh, there is a possibility of skill? slide. The, the, the literature uh, has not focused on digital skills very, very closely, but it has focused uh, on a lot around skill-based training through com like technology. So we do know that provisioning just infrastructure, be it schools or texts or materials, doesn't lead to any meaningful, uh, um, uh, like without any other additional work, lead to meaningful uh, outcomes, right? We also know that some projects in digital skills, which started as digital skills project, uh, like the one laptop per child program, don't really work uh, or have not shown impact in learning outcomes in the studies that have been done on it. Providing just computer hardware does not work. <laughs> but providing technology with a pedagogical change does seem to work. And as long as you customize, customize it to the audience, you get more and more impact. And that's the more recent uh, strand of work that the, that the empirical literature shows. So it means that you have to not just provide like infrastructure or computers or skills training in the, in the abstract, but tie it to a curricular and pedagogical training that might show a lot of results based on the context. So what are the open questions, and this is where I will end. We need more monitoring and evaluation on learning outcomes. We need to have a set of metrics on what digital skills learning outcomes look like. And we need to really rigorously monitor them across projects in terms of what are we doing. It's not just that they have created a certification and gone out. Like, Does it lead to meaningful jobs? Is it the kinds of jobs that they want? We need some work on, on what these outcomes are for digital skills projects, and we need some more evaluation of those. We also need to think about goals-driven digital skills training. This is a criticism that came up, uh, out of the older computer literacy training pro um, 
like model wherein we used to teach people how to switch on and switch off a system, a device, and like teach them very basic things on how to use software without telling them why using that software works. And some projects in their pedagogy have really moved away from that where they said, we will not teach you just Microsoft Word. We will teach you how to build a resume using Microsoft Word if you want a job. Or we will tell you how to use a mobile phone to get information for agriculture services if you're a farmer, as opposed to just tell them, this is how you operate a phone. Uh, the last thing is that like, we need to really think about mainstreaming digital skills in policy making, but right now, there are a lot of ad hoc approaches, but countrywide digital skills strategies, at least in the countries that we are studying in the global south, do not have a systematic approach. And this obviously requires both work with the education department to work within the education system as a whole, but also work on vocational training projects and outside the system approaches. Neither of those, at least in the, pro in the projects that we were studying, really had a coherent, cohesive framework. So there were these loose projects that were doing their own thing but we didn't have an idea of how it coherently fit together with the skills that that country needs or that country is trying to advance in and how digital skills training in its huge spectrum can, can help that. I'll stop here. Great, thank you very much. Um, and uh, uh, commenting on, on the digital literacy programs, uh, Carlos Ray Moreno from APC, please, Carlos. Thanks, Michael, and thanks, Arada, for the presentation. I'm a disclaimer. I'm not an expert on digital literacy whatsoever, so I will talk from, from my own experience, and I really hope that other people in the room who might have more experience can also provide that, that input. Thank you very much for the invitation to comment as well. Um, around the studies, I, the, first, the first question that came to my mind while looking at your presentation was related to the type of studies that were included and, and how maybe those that are found online and that are funded by big funders and need somehow marketing or to reach some level of scale are those that were identified. Um, I wonder how many of those that don't need that type, of, don't receive that funding and don't need that type of, of marketing approach could be included and how they can be included around many of the people that I know in rural areas in South Africa in particular, learn from each other. They don't learn from a program from, actually I totally agree with you and I have some experiences around hardware that was dropped in schools, in high schools, that when we were to visit them to provide connectivity to those anchor institutions that Professor Yu was mentioning, they were in boxes, literally in boxes, because there was not a program about how to, how to deal with the with the confidence of the of the teachers about how to how to install it, my I happen to my mother happened to be a teacher that went through the whole digital revolution in Spain at the time that um, the students knew more than her at the moment that she had to teach them how to to provide digital skills or, or how to use technology to 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 to, to, include, to to be included in the pedagogy of you what you what you were mentioning right and. Uh, the pedagogical improvement, and um, I think those those questions are not taken into consideration when these programs are, are done. What is the psychology of the education? What is the um, confidence of the teacher to to be probably run over by the student, and what that means in places where education is based in a very hierarchical a power relation in between the student and the and the teacher, right? So I don't know how you can incorporate that in the study, but I think I think those are some of the points that my my touch on the on the failure of some of these projects that consider the social the social issues around around digital skills. Because as I was saying, many people learn from each other, learn from friends, learn from uh, from someone showing them something on the on the device or on the computer, whoever has devices and has computers. But also touching upon what Mike was saying, I think there is a whole, a, a whole thing about affordability playing a role on how can you engage, specific, specifically like not with digital skills per se on how to use the device, but what do you get out of using the device? 
um, there is this concept that is called generativity, that is you don't know what you don't know until you know it, and that the internet definitely allows you to to, 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 to learn things that you didn't know you were interested in, and that takes you to new skills and takes you to new uh, ways of engaging with, with, with that, and that then you, you share with your, with your peers and with the people around it. And that, that other component of digital skills training that might not come from big scale. Um, so affordability does, does play a, a big thing, a, a, a big factor. No? If people cannot experiment, if people cannot get interested, uh, on what they would do with those skills, what you were saying, like need assessment. I, well, maybe I don't want to write my CV. I, I don't want to know about spreadsheets and, and, and presentations. I want to engage with fun ways of creating videos or uploading videos or doing other things, you know, maybe local content and, and, and how, how the whole digital skills can be. And I think it is sometimes more I learn more from colleagues than I learn at the school, I would say. So how that can be incorporated in the, in the study, I think it would be, it would be interesting. And <clears throat> yeah, also, uh, well, we see uh, more and more programs around. Uh, so maybe the other thing that I wanted to comment about, also touching around the, the funding and around the, some, some, I mean, everything is some sort of funding, but the, the whole idea of, the economics that Mike was uh, was mentioning before around how we are considering everything within some sort of a market economy, whether everything that needs to be delivered or is delivered needs to be paid for. Most of the things that I've learned in my life, I've learned from people that didn't charge for them, digital skills or others. I think in many of the places where digital skills are not there in place, there are other systems, other ways of sharing and exchanging that no, do not necessarily fit in the market economy. Maybe someone shows you how to use a computer in exchange of a meal, and it's impossible to incorporate that into the funding and to the, into the other things. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. I, Michael told me to be underneath six minutes, and I'm there now. So thank you. OK, thank you. I think we'll. Uh, we're, we're trying to save up uh, enough time for questions at the end, so we'll move to the final set of speakers. The final critical issue that uh, the group has been studying and that's very important for, um, for access is the gender gap, the gender issues. Um, so um, again, finally from the University of Pennsylvania, Muj Haseki, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, I can get the presentation. Hello, my name is uh, Nuge Haseki, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at One World Connected Project. Um, so I would like to talk about uh, our work on gender uh, for the next 10 minutes. So in discussions uh, around gender and technology, the distinction is often binary. Uh, that is, women face greater challenges uh, than men in accessing and using technology uh, in low- and middle-income countries. However, uh, not all women uh, experience the same levels of autonomy or constraints due to uh, technical, social, economic, political, or spatial factors. And at One World Connected Project, one of our goals is to understand the barriers uh, to women's uh, technology access and use through in-depth case studies and help to build more effective policy and sustainable interventions. So. Um, why is this important? A recent report from ITU shows that the gender gap is growing fast in developing countries. That means the existing interventions and policy are not effective to build the digital divide. Therefore, we need to devise more effective strategies to identify problems and develop uh, impactful interventions. And, um, so the existing literature and reports identified six main barriers to women technology um, access and use. These are infrastructure, financial constraints, digital literacy, privacy and security, and sociocultural context. But most of these are based on single case studies or meta-analysis of the existing literature. And we are contributing to this work in two different ways. So we are empirically analyzing the barriers to a women's technology access and use. And we are looking at the intersections of multiple demographic factors, such as geography and age. And our goal is to help design effective policy and more impact, impactful, sustainable interventions. So 
So we have collected around uh, 100 initiatives that aim to improve gender access and use of internet-based technologies. And the majority of these initiatives uh, in our database are from Africa and Asia. These are the top two regions with the, the largest gap in digital divide. And we generated 15 case studies from 12 countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. And these uh, women-centered projects focus on primarily on digital lit uh, literacy, health, and agriculture. Um, so some of the preliminary findings from our work, women face unique challenges in access and use due to multiple and intersecting factors. Therefore, relaxing just one barrier may not improve their access and use. And addressing multiple barriers simultaneously can help to design more effective and sustainable interventions. And I'll give you a few examples uh, how ex some of the existing projects uh, uh, succeed or fail uh, those intersecting barriers in their programs. So uh, here is one example. This photo shows that uh, what happens to rural areas with poor infrastructure during heavy rain. But although men can still be mobile, it's often more difficult for women to be mobile and go to closest internet access points, uh, for instance. It becomes even more difficult for women with responsibilities for children and the elderly. And we have some case studies that shows in certain geographies, such as rural Bangladesh, there are additional barriers, such that women face resistance from the local community to travel by bicycle. There are social norms around by, uh, riding bicycles for women. And to give you another example, even when women have mobile phones uh, in rural India, they would not use them around their husbands uh, due to status quo. Uh, this becomes more challenging for women when they share mobile phones with their husbands and need privacy while searching information on re uh, reproductive health, for instance, which is a taboo in certain geographies. So to address this barrier, uh, Grand Mark, a community network in rural India, uh, created a woman-only access spot uh, to allow women to feel more comfortable using their phones uh, to search for uh, information. Uh, on another example, in Ghana, uh, families do not often think that learning computer skills are relevant or necessary for their children, but girls face multiple barriers compared to same-age boys because there's a debate uh, around when girls are enough to use, uh, uh, old enough to use mobile phones. We also look at in what ways the scalable projects differ from those that are not and to what extent they address those intersecting barriers. Here are four mobile phone-based uh, uh, services that we examined that aim to improve the maternal and newborn health. And they scaled at different uh, ways nationally or regionally or locally, and they reached to different amount of um, users uh, through this <coughs> intervention. So some of the preliminary findings from that research, allowing women to select the time of the day of the messages increases the chances of message received and read by the target users because of women's roles and responsibilities and they may not be able to check their phones or um, attend to those services uh, offered to them because of these uh, issues. And because women are not often decision makers in certain geographies, also including gatekeepers into the intervention is essential for sustained behavior change. Um, and in certain regions in Africa and Southeast Asia, there are relatively more spoken languages. Therefore, creating local content in mostly spoken local languages is essential to reach the majority of uh, potential users in a country. And altogether, developing interventions that address multiple access barriers at the same time can increase uh, user engagement. And I'll give you a couple of examples how certain, how scaled projects address those uh, intersecting barriers in their programs. Um, here's an example how a scaled project, uh, upon John in Bangladesh, uh, is addressing intersecting barriers. For instance, in both in Bangladesh and Nepal, Pregnant women live with their husbands and mothers-in-laws uh, law, uh, who are often the decision makers. But uh, upon John in Bangladesh target gatekeepers by sending them weekly health messages to change their health behavior, which doesn't exist in Amakomaya uh, application in Nepal, which did not scale as much. 
Here's another example. Um, so HIV is a potential problem among pregnant women in both South Africa and Bo uh, Burkina Faso, which often discourage pregnant women with HIV to reach out to health workers for advice because it's a taboo. So to address this intersecting barrier, Mom Connect allows for anonymous messaging to help desk, again, which is not available uh, in uh, Mosan in Burkina Faso, which only scaled like locally. Uh, compared to Mom Connect in South Africa. Um, finally, um, you can see from these three examples in the, uh, these three projects in Bangladesh, Nepal, and South Africa, uh, when you look at the number of languages and dialects available in the country and the local languages available in their intervention, uh, and when you compare that with the reach, uh, you can see that um, Creating local content in mostly spoken local languages is essential to reach the majority of potential users uh, in a country. So just to uh, conclude, so some of the key takeaways from that research, uh, women face unique challenges uh, due to multiple and intersecting factors. Therefore, relaxing just one barrier may not improve their access and may not be sufficient to, uh, to, for the scalability of the interventions. Therefore, addressing multiple barriers simultaneously can help to design more effective and uh, sustainable interventions. Thank you very much for, for laying out those, uh, those uh, unique challenges and some of the ways to get around it. Now with some comments, um, Claire Sibthorpe from the GSMA. Claire? Great, thank you so much. Um, so I head the Connect Women and Connect Society and Assistive Tech programs at GSMA, and I'm going to speak about gender and, and um, the basis of my comments. So we do a lot of, uh, we have surveys that are across 18 uh, low middle income countries where we talk to individuals about um, their access and their barriers and use. And so I'm going to share some of the findings from that, which I think kind of mm -hmm. reaffirm some of the points you made. But also we then work with uh, mobile operators to help them design strategies to help reach more women with mobile internet or mobile money services. So working very specifically with them on the ground on projects. Um, so just based on the sort of data that we have, I think it's important to unpack kind of the gender gaps, and I think it's to Mike's point about what, you know, what do we mean by access. So if you think about the numbers, 80% of women in low and middle income um, countries have a phone, which sounds very impressive and a lot, but there's big gender gaps. So um, there's, first of all, big gender gaps based on um, location, so the very significant gender gaps in South Asia, in rural locations, so, um, so there are lots of gaps in ownership. But then, and those who don't own a phone um, are the ones who would probably benefit from it most, most uh, furthest away, um, are furthest away from being able to achieve it. So we need to also not acknowledge that there are uh, basic gaps around ownership um, for those who really need it. But beyond that, um, once you own a phone, it's not enough. You need to be able to use it and use it in a meaningful way. So the next sort of, if you own a phone, if you want to go onto the internet, you have to be aware of the internet. Um, and there's a huge gender gap, an even bigger gender gap, um, when it comes to awareness of the internet. And then once you're aware of the internet, then you need to be able to get on, uh, you know, to, to then start to, to adopt and use it. Again, gender gaps grow. So there's an ownership gap, it grows around awareness, and then there's a gap, a bigger gap around internet usage. Um, and once people are using it, we are also seeing in our data that women are using it for less number of services and less intensively than men. So again, uh, it's, uh, I think it's important to um, understand um, the kind of different gaps and, and where I need to target. We've looked at the barriers and when we look at the ownership gap, the biggest barrier is affordability, especially around handset affordability. And then when people are aware of um, the internet, the biggest sort of barrier is literacy and digital skills in terms of getting on. But a, our research and our, our work and evaluation of initiatives that operators are doing highlights exactly what we were saying, which is that there is a, a range of barriers um, that need to be tackled and they all, and it needs to be tackled holistically. You can't. And this kind of barriers, and I think some of them maybe didn't come out maybe as strongly in that is, is so affordability is a big one, as I said, handset, um, digital skills, obviously a big one, relevant content, a big one, but safety and harassment is also a big barrier. So tackling, and it's stopping women from going along 
online, and so we need to tackle those barriers as well. Um, relevant as so a relevant content, yeah, accessibility to these services, which you touched on. Um, so if we're going to address the gender gap, we need to take a holistic approach to the barriers. We need to acknowledge and address social norms. We need to not just address the barriers, we also need to understand um, what are the aspirations of the women you're, uh, that are being reached, which I think it also came up in the comments on the digital literacy, that it's not just about um, pushing, addressing barriers, one needs to understand what are the wants and needs of those who you're, you're trying to reach. Um, so I guess uh, my comments are that it's really important to understand the data. It really, we need to be data and evidence driven. Um, there is no one size fits all. We need to uh, take a holistic approach um, and we need to have clear um, aim, uh, targets of what we're trying to achieve. Again, our data shows that the gender gap in ownership is, while well, access is increasing, it's not, the, it's, the gender gap is not uh, decreasing. Um, so we do need to take targeted intervention. Um, and I sort of a one final comment on that is that I know you were saying that you looked at uh, gender specific um, initiatives. What we are finding in the work that we're doing with the op with our mobile operators, it's not always about having a woman specific product or service. Mm -hmm. It's about considering gender in the delivery of, of your services. So thinking about the marketing, the distribution, do you, are you marketing to women? Do you have female agents in your networks? How are you thinking about um, gender across your existing products? Not necessarily about necessarily launching uh, specific women, women services, um, but having that kind of approach and thinking about it uh, holistically and thinking about the barriers and the needs of the specific women you're targeting is really important. And again, when we've evaluated initiatives, those that just seek to tackle one barrier, uh, it does make a difference, but it does, it's not what changes. Uh, changes. It's when um, initiatives are considering all the different barriers and taking a holistic approach that we see that really um, uh, change is happening. So uh, I think our, our data basically sort of mm -hmm. similarly reflects what, what you're showing. I would say suggest that maybe the sort of safety and harassment issue is something that um, didn't come across in your case studies, but mm -hmm. is, we're certainly seeing, especially in some markets, as being uh, an important issue for, to be considered. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think let's, uh, we've got 15 minutes late, left. Let's take a few questions, uh, maybe three at once. And since my back is turned here, I'll, I'll start behind me, please. Thanks for being patient with me. I was afraid to struggle with the, uh, the machine there. Um, I'm Jennifer Boucher, I'm from RNW Media, we're a Dutch well, Dutch based, we're based in the Netherlands, uh, NGO. And uh, what we do is build digital communities in uh, places where human rights are under threat. Um, so thank you very much. I'm very interested personally also just from my career in, in gender equality and in development work. Um, what we have found uh, in our work is that when you do get women connected, which is quite, quite low indeed, um, you still have to pull them out, they lurk. And one of the ways that we have found some success is engaging them with women-specific content. But then we're not talking about fashion blogs and, and makeup. Sorry, my voice is a bit rabbly. Um, um, but actually, we, we have found success in it. We've actually measured it in terms of, for example, Facebook participation and engagement. We have similar rates of participation as a Facebook average in Yemen and in Libya, but we have actually succeeded in having much higher levels of engagement than the Facebook average. And what we've done is a really simple thing. We've talked about, for example, workplace issues. So we've talked about getting a job as a woman. What are the challenges? What are the successes? And really, women have engaged. We've had a woman blogger, one of the first women bloggers in Libya, a young woman who actually putting out videos on interest, issues of interest to women. So it's a very small experience. It's certainly not a, from a controlled trial, but I thought it was interesting to share this kind of result. Great, Great. thanks. Um, please. Hello, I'm Karsan from Tanzania, and I would just like to speak from a perspective as a youth uh, and from a developing country. The first thing is that we, I come from communities which are really agrarian substance based. Uh, people live under one dollar, which means that you really have to modernize to go to the core of the city to get connected. The problems we have, the first one is that we lack the infrastructure in terms of there is no electricity, that's number one. And another thing, uh, 
people cannot actually afford an equipment to get connected. And people get, as, as, uh, as the lady once said, you cannot quite substitute uh, food or the basic need and internet. And right now, as a young person being born in the internet age, it means that this is how I interact, this is how I learn, this is how I even got the opportunity to be here. So um, how can we kind of create uh, alternative means first to fund this connectivity and another way of making it more relevant uh, to our community case? We do have a community network, or one in Dodoma, but the problem is the spectrum charges are very expensive and uh, there's a, quite a barrier of entry when you want to discuss with legislators in its meaning, you know, it's not meaningful. Now, how do we quite, I think, that the government themselves, the leaders lack this digital literacy awareness so they can make the laws or they can create the mechanisms on how we can actually adapt to connectivity challenges. So I was thinking like, how can we kind of like uh, create a situation that can benefit uh, my case? Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for those observations. One more question. Excuse me. Oh, can, can I uh, there? We'll go. Hey. Um, thank you, moderator. So, uh, my name is Vakas Hassan. I am from the Internet Society uh, Pakistan chapter. Um, I was just wondering, with, or with, this, with your respective studies, if you, if you just had any numbers on the projects that you studied, that well, how many of those projects were actually led by women themselves? And if you think that it is a factor in the success of those projects themselves, and, and I would just add a little bit of background here uh, to this question, of course. Um, so we did a project, a community in Indian networks deployment project in a rural village in Pakistan. In the first phase, connectivity was provided to that village. And in the second phase, uh, we actually provided a girls' high school uh, with a remote education facility where teachers from the capital were teaching the girls of, uh, uh, of the sixth standard in English, math, science, and, uh, and computers. Now, when we were deploying that project, the head of the school, the first question that she asked was, who are those teachers? Is any of them a male teacher? And this just sort of you know, opened a whole new thought process for us. And we realized that we know we need to have female teachers who are going to teach those little girls. Uh, because that was something that was very culture sensitive to that village. Uh, so yes, the teachers were then females, and the, and, and the delta that we found out of the study was amazing that girls were actually more interested in coming to the class and their grades improved. So just to give a little background on this, do you have uh, any examples on where the projects were led by the women? Okay, thank you. Um, I think... Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, very exciting to hear all the about women and children. My name is Samuel Mutungi from uh, Universal uh, Service Advisory Council in Kenya. I would like to hear more about um, what attention the community is giving to the, the people with disability or people with alternative abilities uh, because uh, whereas you're taking care of the children and the women, uh, there's, there's little I've heard about what initiatives, what empowerment, what future do they have in terms of internet application and uh, internet empowerment. Thank you. I think there was one more, please. Hi, Nils Brock from Germany. Uh, one very brief question about the methodology of the digital uh, skills study. So, uh, or two things. Uh, one is, uh, I think it's uh, hard to imagine how you uh, how you measure those digital skills. I mean, on the very functionalist perspective, I can uh, imagine this, but uh, there's also something about uh, a critical awareness of being in a, a digital ecosystem. And uh, how would you measure this? I mean, uh, that somebody makes a difference between you 
news and fake news is uh, something uh, that is really critical in today's world, but uh, how could this be perceived from a, a research perspective? And the other question is, uh, uh, what was the time span uh, of the measured outcome? Because I think there are like uh, short-term effects that uh, you can measure quite well, but uh, there are some effects uh, if we talk about educational uh, programs and uh, digital skills that would uh, take maybe uh, years to, to show on, on a more on a broader range than maybe the, uh, the the things that were foreseen in the first place. Thank you. Great, thanks. I'll ask uh, all of the panelists maybe to just take a t take a turn. Uh, Sharada, if you want to go okay. first. So um, I want. Thank you very much, Michael. Um, I wanted to respond in order to some of the points that were raised both by the discussants as well as by the room. Uh, and Muge will then pitch in uh, to add to that. So the, the way we um, looked at, at uh, digital skills programs really was institutional programs as opposed to more loose uh, ideas around like, like network-based connectivity. Uh, connecting with people who can then teach you skills. And I agree entirely with Carlos that that's not always how we learn. We often learn outside of traditional boxed <laughs> education systems, especially when it comes to digital skills. We were constrained in being able to put that, given that we were not taking a very ethnographic uh, uh, approach to the way we studied these things, we did make an effort to go outside of the more marketed digital skills programs to less known, lesser known digital skills programs, but it was still based under you have to have some kind of institutional structure to do so, and that clearly does have some drawbacks, but the hope is that to people who don't have access to informal social networks that do have these skill sets, uh, I was one of those people. I came from a conservative family that does not have any background in college education. Like, I do not have, uh, I'm the first generation graduate from my family. Access to technology was mediated very much by the ability to have access to people who knew technology and breaking that barrier in itself for some people or some context can be difficult. The idea is that institutional programs programs can at least help in some of those instances, not all. And that's the, the modesty of the co contribution, but also hope that there is some element of, of uh, uh, importance to it. Um, I agree entirely uh, that, that there is a, a lack in terms of teacher confidence. And this is actually shown in some of the qualitative work that we did on our control trial work. We both went to Rwanda to rural schools, very similar challenges. Computers, the OLPC program existed, but it existed in boxes in a lot of rural schools. One part of it was electricity not being able to generate. The other was just teachers were so trained to teach from the text and not so much to teach from the demo in the class. And that really changed how much they were willing to incorporate technology in their own learning, uh, in their own teaching experiences, and that varied widely between the schools that we studied. So clearly, that's a really important thing that we need to account for uh, that isn't given as much attention in current program training. Uh, doing needs assessment, again, as you mentioned, is super important, but doing so before we decide on the structure of the program or the mode of delivery is even more so, and that's not happening at, the t at this time. The, the thing about, um, so now I want to respond a little bit to comments from from the room that had to do with digital skills. Uh, I'll take from the, uh, yeah, I will go very quickly. I'll take from the back in terms of how do you measure outcomes? We, uh, our study right now is cross-sectional and we only take self-reported work from the case studies itself. We are not doing work in parallel in measurement and monitoring. The uh, our evidence has been people choose how many people are connected, but not necessarily how much that connectivity means to them, either short term or long term, because that's the current trend. And I agree entirely that that needs to change. How so is under question, uh, especially around critical skills, fake news detection, disinformation, et cetera. There is some literature in education that's looking at pedagogy and critical thinking. But that is not at least something that we have focused on very much in our research. Time span of our research project, three years and ongoing. Uh, but clearly, it's cross-sectional. It's not a longitudinal study. Uh, next, what do we do for people with disabilities? So we do have projects with disabilities in our database, but very, very limited. So one of them is on teaching uh, to, to people in Braille libraries, uh, to, to people who, don't have, who have visual uh, disempowerment and aren't necessarily able to access materials. Uh, we do have have case studies. Project Zero, which is not a project that we we are part of, collects innovative ways to uh, access, uh, approach people with disabilities, and we included that as part of the studies that we did. So um, uh, studies, the overall database building. Uh, 
on teacher gender. So I think that point is really, really interesting because it's very dependent on context is what we are finding out. In some contexts, having a male mentor in a technology-led industry for women can be incredibly empowering and often shows, and there have been studies that show that having that male mentor take you un under their wing and in introduce you in, the, in a technology-centric world can be empowering. In other ways, women are really important to be able to teach certain subjects, to be able to see that you have role models. It's unclear. <coughs> so that's there. And the last thing that I wanted to say is there are intersecting challenges with supply and demand side. And this is to, in response to Karsan uh, on, on like community networks facing spectrum challenges as well as digital. The idea is to do capacity building. And when you think about conceiving a, a community network, you also think about the needs of the community around digital skills training. That's one way to think about it. And a lot of community networks are doing so already. And, and it's, not, it's not going to solve all of the issues. Spectrum and unaffordability, it's not probably going to solve. But we are going to have to relate at different levels. At the level of the community, at the level of the regulator, at the level of the policy, to be able to interact and create change across the board. OK, we'll try and get through everyone. Maybe just a tweet. <laughs> yeah, I would just let the oh, panelists you see? get OK. Uh, Claire, did you have any? I'm fine, because I know we're out of time. So. <laughs> OK. Carlos? Uh, very, very briefly to the, to the gentleman from, from Dodoma. Uh, the Community Network Summit in Africa took place in Dodoma a month ago. There was more than 140 people. More than 70 of them were Tanzanians. Uh, last week, the Community Networks Association of Tanzania was formed. So there is definitely a lot of people around in the country that are willing to do something. A new community network in Ngorongoro was announced with the support of, the, of National Geographic. Um, the Ministry, the Minister of Communications, Transport, Communi Work and Communications was at the summit, closing at the closing ceremony. He made several commitments around supporting community networks uh, and TV white spaces in particular. So I think you are among the luckiest at this moment in Africa. <laughs> so reach, us, reach out to ISOC, who was uh, a big uh, well organizer of the conference together with APC. We can put you in contact with people in in Tanzania, because definitely things are happening there at the moment. It's probably the hotspot of the continent. Thank you. And J Jane? Thank you. I would just simply say, let's think about different paradigms right now, working with industry, working with community networks, working with the government, um, working with the development agencies. We've got to step outside the box from the traditional way of thinking, both from the economics analyses, from the regulatory policy models. And it's not saying that we're trying to radically change the way spectrum is allocated or do away with the current model at all. But it's a way of looking at allowing for those exceptions to become the rule and not the exception. Um, I just wanted to let you know that we have a booth, booth number one for One World Connected, and we have some of the snapshot of our case studies, regional Africa, Asia, and Latin America, as well as some of the snapshot of our uh, youth-based uh, digital literacy programs. So if you would like to get some of the handouts, please just stop by. And if you have some questions or comments, uh, Shard and I will be there during the rest of the day. Thank you very much. So all that remains is to thank the panelists for a fantastic and very interesting discussions. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh.